And our first speaker is Anne-Sophie Becker. I'd like to invite Anne-Sophie to come to the stage, please. Anne-Sophie is the executive director of ChemSec. Anne-Sophie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. 1963, 3M knew that PFAS was toxic. So back then, they knew what we all here today knew today. Obesity, cancer, linked to fertility, increase, uh, sorry, increased fertility. So back then, they knew that already. The difference is that almost all of us have PFAS in our blood today. We are in Sweden today. The Swedish teenagers have double amount of PFAS in their blood that are considered as a safe level in the European Union. Does anyone of you know what revenue are done per year with PFAS? It's actually only 26 billion euro. It sounds much money. It is not much money. 26 billion euro globally. The social costs are in complete other dimension. 16 trillion euro a year with remediation and health cost. Yeah. They're not even playing the same league. Dolphin, blue whale. So how can it be that we still produce these chemicals? Despite the fact that there's not very much profit made with them. 1963, 73, 83, 2023. And today, we have a green deal in the European Union and a chemical strategy in there. And there, PFAS now finally should be restricted. My name is Anse Becker. I'm the executive director of ChemSec. We are an environmental NGO, and we have a vision, a planet beyond chemical pollution with ChemSec on permanent vacation. And I mean, you are scientists, the majority of you. So actually what I want you to take with you from my speech today is that you're incredibly important to get beyond chemical pollution. Without you, we would never go there. With your research, your scientists, what you do, what you find out, the facts. And we need to communicate it over and over and over and over again to show the facts, how it is, and where are the solutions. So you are so incredibly important, so please take that with you. I will talk a bit about trends that goes on in the society today. First one, what's happening to the chemical industry? Now we're generalizing, yeah? be aware of that. There's increasing lobbying going on to opposing the chemical strategy and parts of that. And at the same time, as we heard before, the petrochemical industry is growing. And actually, all new crackers are planned to produce 40% of fossils directly into the chemical industry and into plastic. That's a huge increase than it was for 20 years ago. But now it's really the thought is chemical industry, plastics. That is what the petrol industry is building new crackers for. So what we hear is that PFAS is used everywhere. Therefore, we can't get rid of it. We need it everywhere. Another thought we often hear is that new technology will solve all problems. And actually, the third one, what is the most important right now for the moment, said that we can't make a green transition without PFAS. And this message that certain stakeholders bring forward is taken up so strongly by political decision makers. They said, OK, but we have to manage the climate. And you see, we have to stack. We have to stay with the PFAS. Yeah? So this is now an incredibly important, important moment now to show that it is possible to manage a green transition without PFAS. That message needs to be repeated over and over again. Um, and another, more positive trend, actually, I'll, I'll go back here. I saw that just for information, 
where you can search in official facts how much money is used for lobbying. This says 33 million euro was used by the chemical industry when you look at official figures for lobbying about different issues, among them the chemical strategy. Another, I wanted to highlight some positive trends as well. We see that consumer close companies, they want to adapt, they want to change, they do not want hazardous chemicals in their products. They do not want that. They want to have alternatives, safer products, they want to sell other products. So this is great, it goes on lots of things. And there are alternatives coming up. And of course, well, at least for European Union, it is like that, that's regulation, or in particular, anticipation of regulation drives the innovation. So there are lots of things going on, lots of positive things. There are alternatives of major of major of uses of PFAS and other hazardous chemicals today. And actually, this I took from my organization. We thought that are there lots of companies, you said, that do not want PFAS. And now we started something we call PFAS Movement. There are more than 100 companies in there. And what they want is really to have a broad restriction of PFAS because they say, then the innovation will start. Then there will come up safer alternatives. We know this. So please, European Union, ban the whole group. So these are also companies saying that. Another positive trend I wanted to highlight are investors. They started... Sorry, there seem to be some mistakes there in the headline. Yeah. They have started to be in interest of chemicals, and why? They're coming from a biodiversity direction and see that we need to tackle chemical pollution. And of course, the two things that drive this in particular right now all kinds of litigation against PFAS producers in the US, as well as the upcoming restriction European Union creates in larger interest among the investors. And they really see that persistent chemicals is a financial risk. In my organization, we have gathered something we call the Investors Initiative on Hazardous Chemicals. There are now more than 50 large investors having jointly 11 trillion asset under man dollars, asset under management, with asset under advice. And they do have dialogues with the chemical producers, the largest one. In communication, then, they ask for phase-out PFAS and increase the transparency and invest in safer alternatives. So there are lots of positive trends going on, actually. And also the trends if you see in the general public, I would say that is divided. In one way you can see that people get tired of sustainability. You know, you go to a shop and you can see that all clothes somehow have a sustainability label. And you get confused, I get confused. What should I buy? This is sustainable, that's sustainable. Are they sustainable at all? So the one way you can see that they get tired in the public of sustainability issues. But on the other hand, I don't think we ever have had so much media attention about chemicals like we have now for PFAS. The major, the most important newspaper they write about this. And I can see that your, your papers, your publications are highlighted in mainstream media. I think this is great. We haven't seen that ever, or maybe since asbestos. So there is a positive trend, awareness among chemicals in the society. If we go over then to some legal trends in our European Union, I think one of very interesting thoughts was going on that had been accepted more and more among political decision makers is actually triple planetary crisis. You can see it mainly in financial legislations in the European Union, where they say, it's okay, if you try to solve, for example, the climate crisis, you're not allowed to harm and other environmental crisis, meaning that you can't solve the climate crisis by increasing the chemical pollution or hazardous chemicals, or destroy the water and uh, save the water and destroy the climate, for example. So this is new, and I think it's very interesting, very important that this mindset is coming among the decision makers, that it belongs together. And then, of course, the chemical strategy. Now we're there. It's exactly more or less three years ago now that the chemical strategy was launched by the European Commission. 
And if we look from our perspective, what we think are very important parts, it's just these two ones here. Banning the most harmful chemicals in consumer products, allowing the use only where essential. And use of PFAS is phased out in the European Union unless it's proven essential for society. I think these are great aims, ambitious, and in my view, realistic that you can do it. So I think this chemical strategy was really mind setting. It's new, it's ambitious, it's, it's great how it was written. The text is really good. And then if we look at now, October 2023, where are we? What has happened so far? What's the result of the chemical strategy? Because there are lots of different legislative pieces that should be improved and changed under the chemical strategy. It was already mentioned before today. I think it's great that we new have new hazard classes. There's endocrine disruptors are seen as endocrine disruptors. Persistent chemicals are seen, really, they are persistent. That's enough toxic. So I think that's great. And I wrote a grouping is here to stay. Yeah, I think it's finally understood that we can't tackle one chemical after each other. It's really here. We will continue doing this. Sometimes bigger groups, sometimes smaller. But this is an awareness. This is broadly accepted. And then, yes, one important piece of this was the REACH review, considered as the most important chemical legislation in the European Union. It most likely will not be a REACH revision now under this commission. It's seen as too political to bring it forward. Some actors might say that maybe we lose more of the protection than we could gain if we bring it forward now. And other ones are not sure, but we most likely will unfortunately not see a REACH revision. Maybe, still, still hoping. But that is reality probably today. Uh, and then I wrote a question mark about the PFAS restriction. It's out there, it's broad, it's good. It was well, well prepared by the countries behind it. But the political reality is so tough for the moment. There is such an incredibly huge lobbying going on saying that, look, we can't do a green transition, <laughs> we are keeping PFAS, it's everywhere, we have to keep it anyhow. So again, to remember, I think the majority of your scientists, you are so important. If you knew since 20 years back that PFAS was toxic, you have to repeat again in all kinds of different forums to make sure that this really land where it should land. So I beg to you, really. Come forward, we can help you to communicate the message, but it's so important. You can never say it too many times. Never in political circumstances. You can only repeat it over and over again and that you are needed because they believe in you, they trust you. So you have the knowledge. <clears throat> so if a little, little bit forward, what can now happen? This is a bit, everything is unclear. As you said before, it's the election, European Parliament, the new commission next year. We don't really know the risk revision. What, what will happen, all these things? So what should we fight for? What can we do? Well, to me, I still think that's extremely important for us to proactively work that we get a ban of all hazardous chemicals in consumer products, also in professional uses later on. But to start here, we have to think through how to communicate this, how to bring it forward. Already now, lots of different actors, including scientists. And it need to be time-bound ban. And furthermore, we have a reach. The legal text is good. It's the improvement that have some problems. So we can work on the improvement to change like authorization, restriction, of very complex processes right now. They could be simplified to make it better results. To work for that as well is important. And restrict groups of chemicals. Yeah. And then I wrote, uh, I think that PFAS is an unstoppable wave. We have gone so far. Yeah. Media is aware of it. Public is aware of it. All citizens, uh, not all, but quite many of the citizens are aware of this is a big problem and it's possible somehow to avoid it. So I think 
this will go on. Companies do not want to have these chemicals in their products. It will happen. So we have to continue work on it to make it a real wave. So again, I just want to say, I think you're so incredibly important and we need to bring forward the research you are doing to highlight for political decision makers the facts, the problems we're having and the solutions. Thank you very much. And Sophie, thank you very much. Thanks. Please take a seat um, on stage here. Um, uh, thank you for introducing us uh, to the whale in the room rather than the elephant in the room. Um, it, it's, uh, it was absolutely fantastic to see those numbers on, on PFAS. I just want to dig in a little bit on that topic in, in a bit more with you. You talk about the wave, the unstoppable wave. So my question is, is it just a matter of time before we get those restrictions? Or does the uh, chemical strategy for sustainability have something of a loophole by talking about essential for society? How do we make sure that it is an unstoppable wave and not just something that has an easy loophole to get out of? Well, of course, there's now the discussion, what is essential use? What is essential for the society? And there, of course, are thousands of different opinions. To me, also to Kemsek, it is like, really, is this necessary for the society to have this product with these chemicals? It's for us not necessary to have clothes with PFAS. Yeah? We can function perfectly fine and have clothes without that. So that is not essential in our view. So there are different views on what should be essential for the society. And that needs to be discussed and decided on. So there's a heavy lobbying going on from all sides about that. C can I follow this up there? Because you, you did talk a little bit about the fact that you didn't, f in your view, the green transition mm -hmm. doesn't need to be, if you like, it doesn't need PFAS, it doesn't need some of these chemicals. Can you explain why that's your view and what the alternatives would be? Well, there are lots of alternatives out there. For example, heat pumps. Yeah? It's important questions in some European countries because they want to reduce the dependency on fossil fuel. And today, the market of heat pumps without PFAS as a cooling system just have 10% of the market. 90% are with PFAS. So just imagine what we just could do with changing because the technology is already there. So this is an example of, yes, we can do a transition without PFAS. So it's not actually the fact that the technology doesn't exist, it's rather that deployment hasn't reached a scale. I mean, there are for sure there are some uses where we do not have viable alternatives mm. and maybe we won't find that for certain uses, but that might mean that we can reduce the use of PISA with 98 percent. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And it's to remember always that when you ban something, when you change something, there are coming up alternatives, then the innovation starts, the research, so it used to push the mm. market quickly. Mm. Yes, I think that was a really interesting point in your, in your presentation, that regulation can be a stimulus to innovation. If it's actually s making something scarce, then actually that is an in invitation to someone actually to, to come up with something new. There's yes. a new market potentially opening. Um, thank you very much, okay. Anne-Sophie.